Hello. We'll continue our lecture today. We'll start the lecture with uh, what is laminar flow. The major advantage of working in a laminar flow hood is that the work space is protected from dust and contamination by a constant stable flow of filtered air passing over the work surface. So there are two main types of flow. The first one is a horizontal one where the air flow flows from the side facing you parallel to the workspace and is not circulated. The horizontal flow hoods give the most stable airflow and best sterile protection but will blow air soles into your face and are unstable for handling material which is poten potentially biohazardous or toxic. While the vertical one where the air blow down from top of the hood onto the work surface and is drawn through the work surface and either circulated or expelled. The vertical flow hoods gives more protection to the operator. So you can see here a, a diagrammatic sketch for the horizontal laminar flow and you can notice the intake of the room air and the air is uh, the effluent air is coming uh, um, to the operator although the air moves uh, uh, need to be uh, um, uh, filtered so it's filtered uh, through the HEPA filter but still can convey the um, contamination to the outside while in the vertical um, laminar flow the air is drawn from uh, the side of the op operator to the work area and then uh, either recycled or expelled out. Here you can see the layout of the horizontal laminar flow hood. So laminar flow, actually it's a classified as biosafety a safety cabinet, BSC. It is designed to prevent biological exposure to personnel and the environment and also protect experimental material uh, from being contaminated. The types of the biological safety cabinet, three kinds, class one, two, and three, have been developed to meet varying research and clinical needs. For class one and two, uh, the agents used for these ones are low of, of and moderate risk, and the first one uh, provide protection for user only, while the other one provide for user material. For class three, it usually the agent you, uh, you, uh, used there is uh, of high risk, and uh, including. PCL uh, 3 and 4 and also um, provide uh, protection for a user and the material. The BSC cabinets use high efficiency particulate air filters which is called HEPA filters in their exhaust uh, or supply system to protect against exposure to particulates including biological agents used in the cabinet. Ultraviolet is used as well to sterilize the air and exposed surfaces in laminar flow hoods between uses. The HEPA filters is designed to remove a broad range of airborne contaminants, including fine dust, smoke, bacteria, pollen, radioactive particles. For BSL-1, Biosafety Level 1, the working involving well-characterized agents not known to cause disease in adult humans and present minimum, minimal uh, potential hazard to laboratory personnel and environment. For BSL-2, the work involving agents that pose a moderate uh, hazard to personnel and in the environment. For BSL-3, clinical diagnostic teaching research or production facilities where work is performed with exotic, exotic, exotic agents that may cause serious or potentially lethal diseases through inhalation route exposure. For BSL-4, work with dangerous and exotic agent that pose a high individual risk of life-threatening disease, aerosol transmission, or agents with unknown risk of transmission. So actually, um, uh, re researchers who work on coronavirus need a BSL-4. Here you can see a picture for a class 2 type A2 a cabinet and the class 2 type B2 cabinet. Here as well you can see a picture for class 3 cabinet, you can notice that there is a 3 a HEPA filter, 2 of the HEPA filter for the exhaust here 
and one of the HEPA filter for the inhalant ear. And here you can see that the operator used, used a, a built-in gloves for working inside the hood. You can see as well this is a, a complicated class 3 cabinet which enables the working of uh, two or three max uh, operators. So, for the top uh, product pro uh, types of protection and the the, uh, the kind of uh, PSC uh, used for pro if you need to protect uh, or concern to the protection of the product, you need a minimum class two or class three if the laminar flow uh, flow is uh, uh, included. For personal protections and the microorganism protection from the cabin uh, from the uh, contamination, you can use either of the three classes. For volatile radionuclide or chemical protection, you need class 1, class 2, type P2, or class 3. F this table cho shows uh, the percentage of recycled air and is host air and the con control plenum surrounded by and the by safety level. You can see that uh, in type 1 and type 3, uh, uh, all of the air is getting out as exhaust air, 100%. While you can see in um, as well as type 2, uh, B2. And you can see that in type uh, 2, A1 and A2, 70% are recycled air. In type 2, B1, 30% uh, are recycled air. And you can see most of them, uh, the pressure is uh, negative. Uh, continuing the elements of um, aseptic environment, we'll talk about the work surface. It is essential to keep the work surface clean and tidy. The following rule uh, should uh, be observed. First, to start with a completely uh, clear uh, surface. Swipe the surface and anything entering the hood with 70% alcohol. Bring onto surface only those items you require for a particular procedure. Between procedures, remove everything that is no longer required and swipe the surface down. Arrange your work area so they are so that you have easy access to all items without having to reach over one to get at another. You have a wide clear space in the center of the bench, not just the front edge to work on. Number six, do not allow your hands or any other non sterile items to pass over an open flask or a dish. Seven, work within your range of vision. Eight, mop any spillage immediately and swap the area with 70% alcohol. Remove anything or everything when you finished and swap work surface down again. Ensure that the space below the work surface is cleaned out regularly at least once per week. Notes why 70% ethanol is used as a dis disinfectant instead of 100% ethanol. 70% ethanol kills the microorganisms by dissolving the plasma membrane. Water acts as a catalyst in the denaturation of protein of cell membrane. So it takes more time in evaporation from surface, so that's increase the contact time of the ethanol to the microorganism. While 100% ethanol coagulates proteins suddenly by creating a protein layer that protects other protein from further coagulation. So while 70% ethanol solution have a slower rate of coagulation of all protein of cell wall and microorganism dies. If you have too much equipment too close to you, you will inevitably brush the tip of a sterile pipette against a non-sterile surface. Furthermore, the laminar airflow uh, will fail in the hood that is crowded with equipment. Here you can see here you can see how the inserting of a pipette in a pipette control. Pipette being inserted correctly with grip high on the pipette above the graduation and the pipette pointing away from the user, like figure B. Circled area mark the potential risk in, in the uh, left figure. Inserting a pipette in a pipette controller with tip of the pipette pointing away from you so that it is your line of sight continuously and not hidden by your arms. And you can see from the uh, figures the correct and wrong ways of uh, inserting a pipette in a pipette controller. Personal hygiene is important while working in cell culture. 
Washing will also reduce loosely adherent microorganisms, which are the greatest risk to, uh, to your culture. Surgical gloves may be worn and swapped frequently. Caps, gowns, and face masks are required under the good manufacturing practice, practicing, practice GMP when working with laminar flow. If you have a long hair tied back, when working aspect, uh, aseptically uh, on an open bench, do not talk. Now we'll talk briefly on the culture vessels and substrate. So generally, the cell yield is directly proportioned to the surface area. So you have uh, the cell yield, so as you can see from the figure, a line chart. So there is a lot of uh, culture vessels. So you can see in this uh, figure, you can see the 6 well and 24 well and 96 well uh, micro titration plates used for cell culture. Here you can see the Petri dish three sizes, it says 3.5 and 5 and 9 centimeter diameter dishes. Here you can see the plastic flasks, you have uh, four sizes, the T10, T25, T75 and T185 centimeter square. Uh, and this represents the surface area for the gross of the uh, uh, cells. This is another type of flask, it's called the multi-surface flask. It's actually here, it's a treble uh, flask with 380 centimeter gross um, uh, surfaces that are seeded uh, simultaneously. Although the gross surface total is 240 centimeter, the sh shelf space, uh, space it is equivalent to a regular 80 centimeter uh, square flask. This flask is best used with a filter cap in a CO2 incubator. So, and the advantage of using this flask is uh, saving a lot of flask and space as well inside the incubator. Here you can see that most best three dishes and the flask need to be ventilated. In figure A, you can see the vented petri dish actually through the small ridges that raise the lid from the base and prevent a thin film of liquid from the condensate from sealing the lid and reducing the rate of gas exchange. While in flask, you can see that the cap have a get it's a gas permeable cap. There is a filter uh, for this uh, 10 centimeter uh, square flask. Here you can sh see how the non random gross appears uh, in flask. So, this is examples of ridge, ridges seen in cultured monolayers in dishes and the flask. And this is probably due to the resonance in the incubator from fan motors or due to the opening and the closing of the incubator doors. So, the cells in the media before attachment just move with the media until attached and they start to grow, uh, forming these non random graphs. We'll talk briefly on the different media and supplements, some and some of the physicochemical uh, properties. pH is an important factor in the growth of cell culture. Most cell lines grow well at pH 7.4. The phenol red is used as an indicator in the culturing medium. It is red at pH 7.4 and become orange at uh, pH 7, yellow at pH 6.5, and lemon, lemon yellow uh, below 6.5. Now more pink at 7.6 and purple at 7.8. So phenol red uh, pH indicator is a standard set of solution uh, from far, you can see from the far left to the far right, uh, are un, are un, far left and far right are unacceptable unaccept, and need immediate action. So you need to do a medium change or subculturing. So let's talk about the balanced salt solution used in the culture media. The balanced salt solution is composed of inorganic salts and may include uh, sodium uh, bicarbonate. Heap is buffer uh, normally used to maintain the cor correct osmolality. The complete media, the term complete media implies a media that had led all its that had it all its constituents and supplements like essential amino acids, vitamins, glucose, and salts. It is usually made up of defined medium components whose unstable uh, constituents like glutamine, serum, uh, growth factors, or hormone may be added just before use. Glucose is included in most media and it is a source of, source of energy used by cells uh, in the process of glycolysis. 
Antibiotics were originally introduced into culture media to reduce the frequency of contamination. However, the use of laminar flow hoods coupled with a strict aseptic condition or techniques makes antibiotics unnecessary. Antibiotics have a number of significant disadvantages. They encourage the development of antibiotic resistant organisms, they hide the presence of low level contaminants, and they may hide a mycoplasma infection. They have anti anti metabolic effect that can cross react with mammalian cells, and they encourage poor aseptic techniques. Serum as a component that is added to the complete medium. Serum contains growth factors which promote cell proliferation and adhesion factors as well, uh, and anti-trypsin activity which promote uh, which uh, which promote cell attachment. Serum is also source of minerals, lipids, and hormones. The fatal bovine serum FDS is the most widely used in most uh, tissue culture. So you need to test serum before you apply into the uh, cell culture. A firm quality control is usually performed to test serum. There are four main parameters for testing serum. Plating efficiency, uh, how this uh, serum uh, promotes survival and proliferation. Gross curve, you need to do a cross curve for uh, introducing serum because the gross curve should be plotted for cell growth in each serum so that the lag uh, period doubling time and cell density at the uh, plateau can be determined. Preservation of cell culture uh, characteristics. So you need to have um, a, a serum, especially between batches, uh, to have the same uh, quality of uh, uh, preserving the cell culture uh, characteristics. So you need to test that. Sterility, you need to test the serum if the serum is uh, free from con uh, microorganisms or contaminants. The essential factors in serum include adhesion factors such as fibronectin, peptides such as insulin, BDGF, TGF beta, that regulate growth and differentiation, essential nutrients such as minerals, vitamins, fatty acid, and the intermediary metabolites, hormones such as insulin, hydrocortisone, estrogen, and triiodothyronine. All these constituents regulate membrane transport, differentiation, and the constitution of the cell surface. So to isolate the tissue, before attempting to work with human or animal tissue, make sure that your work fits within the medical ethical rules on experimentation with animals. The work with human biopsy or fatal material requires the consent of the local ethical committee or the consent from patients, patient or his, his or her relatives. Work with human tissue should be carried out minimum at BSL level 2 in a class uh, 2 cabinet. Do not dissect the animal in the tissue culture laboratory as the animal may carry microbial contamination. Dissected tissue can be held at 4 degrees for up till 72 hours, but the faster the better yield. So for mouse embryo, we'll start to see how we obtain tissue from mouse embryo. It is a convenient source of cells for undifferentiated mesenchymal cell cultures. These cultures are often termed as mouse embryo fibroplasts. The optimum age is 13 days, 13 days of the embryo, and, the, and at this stage, it still contains a high proportion of undifferentiated mesenchyme. As well, the dissected individual organ is easier at 13 to 14 days, and the most of the organs are completely formed by the 18th day. So starting to get tissue from a mouse, you start to, by swabbing the abdomen, and then tearing the skin to expose the abdominal wall, and then you start to opening, open the abdomen, as you can see in figure D. After that, you reveal the uterus in situ, and then you remove the uterus out from the mouse, uh, uh, from the mouse, and then you start to dissect uh, uh, the embryo, uh, dissect the embryo from the uh, uterus, and remove the embryo from the uterus, as you can see in figure G and H. After that, you remove uh, the membranes that surround the embryo. It's optional to remove the head, uh, uh, chopped it away, but you need to chop the embryo into small uh, pieces. Then you uh, transfer pieces of the um, uh, of this tissue to trypsinization flask uh, for warm trypsinization 
and another piece is in a small flask, flask for cold terrestrialization. And you can see in figure N um, how the flask is kept on ice. So after getting tissues from mouse, uh, the, uh, we'll talk about uh, getting tissue from chick embryo. Chick embryo embryos are easier to dissect as they are larger than mouse embryos at the equivalent stage of development. Like mouse embryo, chick embryos are used to provide mesenchymal cell primary culture uh, to, for proliferation analysis. Because of their larger size, it is easier to dissect out individual organ to generate specific cell type, such as hepatocyte, cardiac muscle, and lung epithelium. So you can see here, you start by removing chick to remove a chick embryo from an egg. You can see that you swab the egg with alcohol, and then you crack the egg and peel 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 off the shell. Then you, after peeling out the shell, uh, you can see that um, uh, the chorioallantoic membranes are visible, CAM, and the, and the vasculature is revealed. Then you remove the chorioallantoic membrane with the forceps, as, as shown in Figure F. After that, you grasp the embryo around uh, around his uh, its neck and withdraw, and you try to withdraw the embryo from the egg, and uh, you uh, isolate this ten-day embryo in a petri dish. You start by removing the head, then you remove uh, the eye, then you do dissect out lens, you peel off the retina, and you scooping out uh, the brain. After that, uh, you are now halving the trunk, uh, 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 cutting it into two halves. You are teasing out the heart and lungs from the anterior half. You are teasing out the liver and the, the, and the gut from the posterior half. Now, you insert the tip of the scalper between the left kidney and the dorsal body wall, trying to squeeze out the spinal cord, peeling the skin off the back of the trunk and the hind leg. After that, you slice muscles from the thigh, and now you can see in figure N, organ rudiments are arranged around the periphery of the dash. From the right clockwise, you have, we have the following organ uh, as uh, in the sequence that have been dissected, brain, heart, lungs, liver, and so on. For human biopsy material, handling human biopsy material presents certain problems that are not encountered with animal tissue. It usually is necessary to obtain a consent from either you obtain from the hospital ethical committee from the attending physician or surgeon or from the donor or patient or the patient patient's relative so now you isolated the tissue and there is a lot of other sources for isolating tissue from embryos we have discussed how you isolate tissue from a mouse and mouse embryo and chick embryo after you isolate and dissect and isolate uh, tissue, uh, as, we, as we said before, you remove any fatty acid during dissection and necrotic cells. So you either do fine dissection, uh, chopping down, or mechanical disaggregation or enzymatic disaggregation. So in a fine dissection, you have a primary explant that give, uh, this explant will give an outgrowth that, that can you do a subculturing and you can do as well, uh, take this uh, explant to transfer to another plate to do a secondary explant culture. While for mechanical disaggregation, uh, you can do that by sieving, syringing, syringing, or vigorous pipetting. You have dispersed primary culture that you can continue to have a subcult subculturing until getting a cell line. For enzymatic disaggregation, you have three methods, either using a cold trypsin or a warm trypsin or a collagenase. For cold trypsin, you need over overnight, uh, uh, overnight uh, uh, cold and short incubation of time. While for long uh, trypsin, you need a long incubation and repeat assembling. For collagenase, you need long um, incubation plus a complete medium. After that, you need to do a centrifuge to remove the uh, proteases. And then you resuspend and seed, and now you have a dispersed uh, primary culture that you can subculturing, and you, you have the cell line. Here you can see how the primary uh, explant culture schematic diagram uh, for showing uh, the, the process of uh, disaggregation. 
So you can see here uh, that you collect the tissue samples in a dissected a dissection balanced salt uh, a solution. Then you chop uh, these samples in a petri dish into smaller pieces. Then you wash out by suspension. In um, you wash out the excess uh, uh, debris. So you can see in, uh, in another way uh, uh, the primary explant culture from mouse uh, the squamous uh, skin carcinoma. You can see that uh, it can give outgrowth about three days after explantation, uh, like the bottom of figure A, uh, and you can see uh, you can collect the uh, dispersed cell. Here you can see the outgrowth from the explant after removing of the explant about seven days after explantation, and you can see the initial of the primary culture in figure C. So what's mechanical disaggregation? You have four types of mechanical disaggregation, either by do scrapping, uh, scrapping the tissue against the, uh, the bottom of the blade, or uh, sieving, uh, that means forcing tissue uh, through sieve with a syringe uh, piston, or by doing a syringing as well, uh, drawing uh, the tissue into a syringe through white bore needle, or by uh, 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 a trituration by pipette, so the pipette pipetting tissue fragments up and down through wide bore pipettes. All these four types of mechanical disaggregation can be used for disaggregation of tissues. Finally, you can see here four figures for cell lines that have been generated from gastric gastric carcinoma. You can see uh, the, how the cells behave and how the uh, difference in shape between these uh, cell lines. And um, some of them, most, all of them are monolayer cells, but some of them, like figure D, uh, a type of carcin gastric carcinoma cell line that uh, uh, grow in, um, in batches or colonies, but it's still a monolayer. Uh, another uh, figures for other uh, cell lines, uh, first two from the pancreatic uh, cancer and the second two from uh, human glioma, and you can see how the cell is different and how the characteristic shapes uh, differ from each other. Thank you.